been dealing with it for like 11 years, and it won't go away. I've actually, um, I actually implemented Moodle, which is an open source, um, and I did it on my website, just playing around. I'm like, oh, this is really nice. An open open source community. You know, we'll look, we'll look at information systems analysis design, and um, it should be user driven. You know, um, users define what functionality they need and how the process works. When you look at the open source community. What is it? It's user driven. So you look at Moodle, you know, which is essentially an open source content learning management system similar to Blackboard, being developed by users. It's exactly it's intuitive. It's like, yeah, this is the way it should work. Whereas yeah. Now you understand why I did CS100.com too. After you know, I did that after I put up with Blackboard for like eight years. And I'm like, okay. This, this this can't go on. Got to do something different. Uh, by the way, is anyone watching the? Um, is anybody watching any of the lecture captures? I watch one. Okay. I can't because then you know it's it's like you hate your voice and you hear all the little all the little things that you do. I'm like, I really do that. So, um, oh well. So it's so be it. Um, I actually started. It was really funny. I started over the end of before I did. I did a couple. At home, there's a few things. We have three dogs, so that and so the house is just in a constant state of turmoil. You hear things in the background; it's like you're screaming at the dogs and all kinds of things. All right, this this probably isn't the best idea. Um, so let's start doing it here. Okay, um, so here we go. Um, chapter two, systems unit. Um, so. I presented this last week. Of course, everything we do in the computer has to be modeled, has to be represented. Okay. So essentially, what it is is it's a study in abstraction. Okay. Of course, I can't put a, you know, cars in highways into the computer. I have to create a simulation. It's an abstraction. It's, an, it's a representation. But similar to everything we do in this course, we break everything down and we start at the foundation and move up. So at the very basis, how do we encode data? Well, the computer itself is based on digital logic, binary. Two states, on or off, true or false, zero or one, however you want to you know, put it, we're referring to the same thing. And we will look at Boolean data, Boolean data later, which is Boolean, Boolean data type is a you know, true false. It's based on uh, Boolean logic. OK. So that is our basis. We have a binary computer. <clears throat> if we look, we know, we're probably pretty familiar already, the bit, the binary digit is the smallest unit of data that a binary computer can recognize. However, note, the smallest addressable unit is the byte, okay, which is 8 bits. So while, there, while we can work with individual bits, and we will do that from time to time, like that, Typically, we work at the byte level. Now, note the byte. Yeah. So how big is the megabyte? Megabyte would be a million. Okay, we'll, we'll actually get to that too. Um, so the byte is eight bits. Every byte, and memory is com is comprised of bytes. And we think of memory as one long contiguous array of bytes, which means one after another. Okay. Uh, every byte has two things associated with it: contents and an address. And we access the contents, because really that's what we're interested in. We're interested in the contents. But we access the contents through the address. Right? And you heard me state this, you know, in reading computer science tests, you know, text, you'd see the word reference. Okay? Well, reference is an address. Okay, now note something else. We need to read with a very discreet attention to detail. Fit. Denote, denoted with a lowercase b, whereas the byte is denoted with an uppercase b. Okay, we need to understand it and look at that closely in all instances. Now, tomorrow, we will cover numbering systems. Um, <clears throat> the text presents numbering systems fairly well. Um, and in the back of the text, um, there's a tutorial, there's an algorithm on converting between decimal to, to um, binary and back and forth. Quite often, we can do it quicker by inspection, especially, I know we have some networking people in here, 
that's what we do by inspection. Um, and I do cover this as well. So here it is. It's in the CS100.com um, lecture topics. It's under the O2 architecture hardware lecture module 2. In that sub menu is the numbering systems. Please read through this before tomorrow. Okay, it'll become very clear. So I'm actually going to cover, I'm actually going to present the tertiary numbering system or numbering system based on three. The reason if you understand the algorithm, you can do it. We can do the conversions in any base. Okay? One of the problems that we have, just as people, numbering systems, CIS students, is we are so good at processing information, we have forgotten the algorithms that we use to count, to add, to subtract. We just do it. Okay? We're just so good at it. We've, we've been doing it for so long that we just do it. We need to relearn how we learned it in the first place. Because once we understand that, we can apply it to anything. So, so please read through that. So here are the prefixes. Okay, because again, talking about bytes in today's world, you know, is they're they're too small. We need a greater understanding. We need we need to deal with larger quantities. So we deal with quantities in groups of a thousand. Okay. Kilobyte, a thousand to the first, one thousand. Okay. Megabyte, a thousand square, a million. Okay. Gigabyte, a thousand to the third, a billion. Okay. And so forth. Okay. A trillion, quadrillion for the petabyte. Um, and interestingly, some companies, Google, you know, they're up, they're dealing with data in the zeta and yotta byte range. That, that's it's it's mind blowing. Um, so I kind of put this in here and then ask a question because I'm not sure if people will remember it. Um, and it's, of course, the networking people will get this right away. But um, how long will it take to download a one megabyte file on a one megabit a sec per second connection? Anyway, one megabyte on a one megabit per second connection. Well, how many bits in a byte? Eight. So how long will it take to, to download one million bytes on a one million bit per second connection? Eight seconds. Okay. Just by noting, okay, and what I did I did this for a reason, to drive home to drive home the fact that in file sizes, memory, things like this, we're dealing with bytes. When we get to net networking, or even USB. We talk about net USB connections, the latest USB 3.0, I forget what it is, you know, four megabits a second or something like that. We're talking about bits. Make sure you read this, because the last thing you want to do is to develop a system that falls short. You know, your company is, is deploying video conferencing, things of this nature, file sharing. Well, you're dealing with bite, you know, files and byte sizes, whereas your networking is going to be in bits per second. Okay? So make sure, I did this really just to make sure that people start reading with a very high level or high attention to detail. Other people, I'm just downright boring here. I'm sorry. Uh, numbering systems. Okay, so decimal numbering system, of course, base 10. Binary system, numbering system, base 2. And with this, of course, we when we look at numbering systems, we're looking at the base, we're looking at the powers of the base. So again, I'm really just kind of glossing over this, and we're going to do this in earnest tomorrow. Um, but base 10, we already know, um, powers of 10. You know, the one's place, the tens place, 10 to the one, 10 to the first. The two's, uh, the hundreds place, 10 squared. Okay. And when we see something, 7,216, we don't even think that it's, you know, we know it, but we don't think about it as... 7 times 1,000 plus 2 times 100 plus 1 times 10 plus 6 times 1. Okay? Our brains, we just, we just kind of think about it. Um, but that's what we need to do when we go back into binary and hexadecimal. The binary, of course, is powers of 2. 2 to the 0, the 1's place. 2 to the 1st, the 2's place. 2 squared, the 4's place. 2 third, the 8's place. And when we're talking about binary, with, with respect to a computer, typically we do extend it and talk about the entire byte. So we would have two to the zero, all the way up, all the way up to two to the seven. 
okay, for a bite. It's important, and you should memorize at this point, the, the highest value, the, the largest value we can represent in a single byte is 256. Okay? And that will become important. Um, or you'll realize why it's important very soon. OK. So <clears throat> that's the way, of course, we represent numbers. And we're not going to get into you know, two's complement and other things here right now. We also need to represent text. Okay? Um, for a long time, we were based in the ASCII, the American Standard um, Code for Inter Information Interchange. Um, and we see that the ASCII representation of characters, and this is just a subset, of course. If you want to see a full ASCII table, I believe there's one in the appendix of the CS100 text. And I'm sure there's one in the appendix of the Java text. Um, and, and of course, you can find them online as well. Um, <clears throat> so ASCII, we encode each character in a byte. So I actually just gave the answer. How many characters can we represent in ASCII? We have a full byte. What's the largest value we can represent in a byte? 256. So I can represent 256 characters in ASCII. A newer standard, um, and you know, Java's been doing this for a long time, is Unicode. I'm not going to talk about ABC, DIC. Um, I'm not even sure IBM is even still using it. Um, but Unicode, anywhere from two bytes to four bytes. Okay, Java at first was using two bytes, uh, and with two bytes, 16 bits, we can represent 16,000 characters. Okay. So ASCII was fine for the English language and also the other keys, you know, control, delete, things like that, you know, F1, control, F1. But it wasn't enough to encode all the characters of all the alphabets in the world. Now, of course, with a 32-bit Unicode character, okay, four bytes, we can now encode four million characters. And that will just about take care of every character on the planet in every language. Okay. Graphics data audio data, um, and video. I'm not going to cover real in detail here, um, very high level detail here. We have a full chapter on multimedia, so we will look at that in further detail. Um, but at its very basis, um, graphics data. If I look at taking a picture with a cell phone or you know, scanning an image, what actually happens? A grid is superimposed over whatever we're going to sample. Okay, and of course, the grid is you know a table comprised of cells that can be referenced based on their row and column indices. Um, and then beneath that cell will be sampled. Now, of course, the simplest is like a grayscale. I can do that in a single byte, zero to two hundred and fifty. Though, of course, is color, and then I have red, green, and, and blue components RGB. And if I encode or capture the red component in the byte, the green component in the byte, and the blue component in the byte, I see I have three bytes to record the color beneath each cell. Three bytes, three times eight, 24-bit graphics. Okay, we're all familiar with 24-bit. And we're very familiar, of course, with 32-bit graphics. So what is 32 bits? Well, if I have an extra byte, I can also record texture. Um, is the surface shiny? Is it textured? Is it dull? Other things. Okay. So with 32-bit gra graphics, of course, I can get far more real realistic. Um, now, that's traditional. Um, has anybody heard? And things are changing quickly. Has anybody heard of the Lytro camera? Okay. I'll bring one in. You have one? Yeah. Uh, we actually got one for the department last last year. Okay. So this is the standard way of capturing graphics. Okay. Determine what are the RGB components of each cell. The Lytro camera captures the vectors. Okay. We know that we see color because light bounces off it, off the surface, and that's, that's what we perceive. We're actually perceiving the vectors that hits our eye. And that gives us a sense of, well, it gives us spatial awareness, too. The Lytro camera captures the vectors. And I'll bring it in when we get to graphics. You don't focus. You just point and shoot. You point, there's no autofocus. I'll describe it. It captures the vectors. 
So it actually knows where the objects are in 3D space. You literally point and shoot. You bring it back to your computer, and then you say, focus on this flower three feet away, and the flower comes into focus. And then you click another area, focus on that seagull 300 yards away, the seagull comes into focus. Well, on the screen, yes, you capture it. It has the vector information captured, and then you choose what you want to bring into focus. This is what you're saying, you just pick up, put your face click on it. Click. So instead of normal, no, it cap no, it captures the environment, and then after the fact, post production, you tell the application oh, what to focus on. Yep. Now they just added the ability to change your point of reference. Now it's not great. You can change it. You know, you capture it, and now you can say, okay, show me the picture as if I were ten feet to the right, ten feet to the left. We've all seen this, you know, in the crime scene investigation, things like that. You know, they're using these special things and like, what's that in the mirror? Let's see what it looks like. And that's, you know, to some extent, well, it's, it's ex extrapolation. You know, so it's all simulation or, it's, you know, but it's not actually what could really be done. This actually makes science fiction, some of the things that we've seen in the movies, actually real. When you think about it, how many times have I said, and you'll, you'll get tired of me saying this, you know, Business, IT, and society. You know, or quite often when technology comes out, we don't see all the uses that a technology will, will give us. Um, think back to the Boston Marathon bomb. What took place? Everybody had all these pictures because nobody knew what they were focusing on, and they just kind of sent them in. You know, the police and the police packaged everything up and sent it off to the FBI and to Quantico, and they did all kinds of you know extrapolation, things like that, and kind of pieced it together. Think about it. A single person had a Lytro camera and had taken a shot. It would have been five seconds later after, or whenever the police got it, focus on him, APB. Five minutes later, an APB would have been out. Lytro, L-Y-T-R-O. And I'll bring it in. We'll actually look at this when we deal with graphics. I don't really want to go down this road. Oh, it's tiny. Oh, yeah, it's tiny. Right? And you think about how this is going to change motion pictures. Right now, it's not, they don't have a motion picture version of it, but it's coming. You know, you know, if you can do it now, it's coming. Think about shooting a motion picture. You shoot up, you set up ten of these just around a perimeter. Roll. That's it. No more focus, you know, no more direction of focus on this. It becomes the director after the fact. Let's focus on this. Bring this into focus, bring that out of focus, make that blurry. It is amazing. So if you get a chance, go to Lytro.com, check it out. Um, but we're, we'll present it in class, too. Um, it, these things, Lytro, L-Y-T-R-O. Yep. And we're going to look at robotics later. Um, drone computer, you know, drones, flying drones. And it becomes really scary. You know, the ability of these drones just to fly around and capture everything. And there's a lot of ethics there. We'll, we'll look at that, too. Yeah. Where we're going is a, both an exciting and frightening place. Um, okay, audio data. Again, we're going to look at this in much greater detail. But in its very simplest form, what is audio data? It's a, it's a, it's a waveform, right? It's a sinus, sinusoidal wave. Okay? It has a temporal component. So if I'm going to capture that and represent that digitally, well, I need to sample it at intervals. Right, a sampling rate, but then I need to capture where is that waveform at that sample. So I need to divide each sample up into segments. Okay, and we know, you know, with MP3s, what do we have? You know, we have a. It's actually a streaming rate is what it's presented to us, and what are the samples multiplied by the subdivision? And that's what it is. And I do need to introduce something. Um, Two types of compression. There's lossless compression and lossy compression. Lossless compression. Lossless compression, you lose no data. You can compress something, get a smaller file size, and then later you can actually restore it. And this is important for business data, your hard drive. You can, you know, you're running out of space on your hard drive, you compress your hard drive. You don't want to 
uncompress it and have your operating system up. Oh, no, sorry, we discarded that file. Okay? That's gone. Okay? Databases, business data, hard drives, things of this nature. Okay? Lossless compression. Lossy compression is acceptable for anything where human perception is involved. MP3s, JPEGs. Because I'll look at some JPEGs, you know, and, and JPEGs you get to determine what the resolution is. You can determine the quality. Okay? And why do we compress these things? We compress them to save space on the hard drive, downstreaming, things of this nature. Um, so JPEG, determining on the resolution, it may, to me, to my eyes, look just as good as a high resolution you know, TIFF file. MP3s, you get up around, for me, um, you know, 296 kilobits a second or something like that. To me, I can't distinguish the difference between that and a CD rate. That way you know? um, so that, for me, is acceptable. Lossy compression. Because human perception is involved. And actually, a great example, um, video. Motion pictures. 24 frames per second. The video isn't continuous, okay? but it fools us. It looks continuous because our eyes can't distinguish more than 24 frames a second. Okay? It looks continuous. So by its very nature, video is lossy compression. Okay. Um, now, so what do we cover? We have to represent numerical data. Right? Binary. Uh, we need to represent textual data, okay? ASCII or Unicode. But we also need a way to have the machine do its processing. Remember, input, processing, output. Every machine has an architecture or a machine language it understands. Same thing. Those in programming logic one right now, you're writing programs, right? But you're writing it in a high-level language. X gets 3 plus 2. This needs to be converted to a machine language. Now, in Java, it's actually a portable language, and we won't go there. But still, it's being compiled into a language that the machine can understand, in this case, the Java virtual machine. OK. Now, I do want to introduce something, because I'll say it a few times, and sometimes it takes a little while to get this. Um, <clears throat> note I'm using a couple terms here. And they're not, they're, they are distinct. Program and process. Can anyone tell me the difference between a program and a process? It's OK. OK, we haven't covered it. OK. Process is a running program. That's the first correct answer I think we've gotten in like three or four years. Maybe even ever. Yes, a program is a static entity. You write a program. Right? You store a program. You load, right? You install Microsoft Word. You're installing a program. When you execute Microsoft Word, it becomes a process. The distinction is a process is a dynamic entity and it has resources allocated to it. When you have a Microsoft Word is sitting on your hard drive, it doesn't have a file, it doesn't have memory. It's taking up storage, but the operating system is managing that. And storage is a resource. But uh, when you load or execute, Microsoft Word, it gets memory allocated to it by the operating system, a resource. It gets CPU time, a resource. It probably ha you probably have a file of it that you're editing. Okay? The file is a resource. Program is static. Process is dynamic. Process has resources allocated to it by the operating system. And we'll look at that in far greater detail and depth when we get to um, operating systems. Okay, now we're going to look at the unit, the, the actual computer itself. Um, this, by its very nature, is a moving target. Okay, um, this text, you know, it was a 2013 publishing, but even in the text, it speaks about things that are coming in 2012. Um, again, any text that comes out is already dated. Uh, this text is, looks at the system unit very much from a, a PC perspective, um, whereas, you know, we look at mobile computing, mobile phones, look at iPads, tablet computers are taking over. So when we talk about, you know, the system unit, the main case of the unit, the motherboard, and, you know, the hard drive, all these things, 
you know, yes, an iPad has a motherboard system unit. Of course, is the iPad itself. Um, we don't look of look. We don't look at the individual components as distinct. We try to look at them as a whole. Um, but we'll, we'll take a look at this. So, um, as we look at components. By the way, do we have any gamers? Yeah. Any anyone built their own computer? Anybody overclock their CPU? Yeah. I'm not advocating. I have no use. For it. Okay. Um, all these units work hand in hand. And again, I'm I'm out of touch. You you gamers, you, you know your systems at least spec wise far better than I. And it's it's kind of funny. Um, you know, back in grad school, um, all the professors would come to us, you know, grad students. We're buying a computer for my son, I'm buying a computer for my home, whatever. You know, what do I get? And I'm always like, we're thinking, like, how do these guys not know these, these PhDs, you know, IBM fellows, you know? And now it's the same. I look at this and I'm like, I don't know, you know? Um, maybe that's why I went back, you know, have the decisions made for me. Um, so, but a lot of these components, if you're a gamer, it makes it, it makes sense, you know. Um, again, it's the interconnections. The interconnections are the major limiting factor. Um, so back, you know, the dinosaur age, and you know, when I was in grad school, you know, it's the front side bus. You get the fastest front side bus you can afford because that's going to speed up your entire unit. Um, more and more, we're moving to you know, system on a chip where everything is moving onto a chip, the graphics is moving onto a chip, the wireless, of course. Um, the latest, you know, Mac is coming out, I think, in, I think, think September 10th, we may actually get the next Mac Pro with the Haswell processors. And it, everything, are you looking at, you don't think so? I don't like that. No. <clears throat> it, you know, well, here we go. Architecture, in operating systems, there's no perfect operating system. It's, a, it's always going to be a trade-off, you know. Um, ease of use and efficiency. And, and you can never have both. You know, you look at ease of use, a great graphical user interface. Well, what does that GUI require? Memory. It's killing your efficiency you know, by its very nature. Um, so the same thing with, with systems. I look at the Haswell. For me, now, you know, truthfully, it's fast enough. You know, when, when I'm doing my compilation stuff in Eclipse, all this stuff, you know, great. You know, a faster processor, yes, would do it in 3.2 seconds rather than 4. Okay. You know, I get it. But for me, battery life, you know, so I look at the Haswell and that, what they're saying, 12 hours. Yeah. I mean, now I'll, I'll run the thing dry in 6, but with granted, I run this MacBook Dry Pro in about like 2.5, so not attached to power. Um, so yeah, for me, battery life is a driving factor. You know, as I'm called from my office here and there, moving around, battery life for me is, is probably the most important thing, which is scary, you know? So it's, it's all about what it's, who it's for. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so, so we're seeing that with the Haswell, everything, GPU, I think, is on the chip, and Yeah, so you know, very, very cool. Um, GPUs are the future. I mean, why, why not? They're so cheap too, for, especially AMD. Yep. Holy crap. Yeah. <laughs> if, let's say your grandma needs a computer. She needs a Facebook <laughs> and a fifty-dollar <laughs> processor. Isn't that bad? Right. They're they're not going to be overclocking, right? right. Yeah. Actually, did you hear? Of course, they approved the second chip fab plan in Malta. That's approved now. They're actually talking about a third. Um, and if the third happens, you're looking at another, from what I hear, and again, it's all hearsay, but, um, but from some insiders, another 14,000 jobs in the industry. Um, and and we're, we're sitting on it. Um, but it's not only that, it's not just the industry, it's, it's what they talk about in Silicon Valley and Austin is the multiplier. Because then you get, you need more hospitals, you need more schools, right? 
Hospitals today are, you know, Albany Med and St. Peter's are taking every intern we can provide them because the entire hospital is just getting super high tech. And we'll talk about all this later. You know, meals are now delivered in hospitals by robots, little robotic carts. You know, and you look at someone's programming them, someone's maintaining them, goes right back to IT, schools. So it's all this this multiplier effect. Yeah, you look at another 14,000 jobs at the plant itself, you're probably looking, they, they talk about a multiplier of 10, but probably a multiplier of three for IT jobs. So you're looking at 50,000 new IT jobs in the area. Really scary. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. We're gonna we're gonna look at medicine. What's what's going on in medicine these days with technology is it's it's insane. Uh, boy, can I digress or what? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> power supply. I'm not gonna say anything about power supply. Um, CPU. Um, and we're, you know, of course, we've moved towards, you know, the multiple cores. Um, big advantage of the multiple cores is, you know, for a long time when we had the single core, we just tried to keep increasing the speed. That was that was what we did. And of course, you you increase the speed, there goes the heat. Okay. With the increased heat, what do you need to do? Cool it. What do cool? What does cooling require? Power. So when you get mobile computers based on, say, you know, battery life, things like that, this just doesn't work. Whereas with multiple cores, they can run slower um, and get better and, and more effective throughput. Um, now, again, we haven't covered operating systems yet. But as, I, as we increase the cores, the speed increase is not automatic. It depends on the operating system being able to leverage it to actually effectively perform multiprocessing. And again, there is a distinction, we'll get to it in operating systems, a distinction between multiprocessing and multitasking. We don't need to know that yet. But just, again, they're, they're not one and the same. Um, so, um, <clears throat> processing speeds, again, we use the same prefixes, um, megahertz, gigahertz. By the way, there's, um, I just posted, and it, it's actually old news, it's way back in June, but um, the fastest computer now is in China at 54 petaflops, I believe, essentially twice the speed of the fastest U.S. computer. So just keep, keep that in mind as well. Um, again, you've heard me say this overall. When we talk about the speed of the computer, quite often it's, it's the interconnections. They're the major limiting factor. You need, and it's really apparent on your phones. You know, I can open an app on my iPhone real quick. Okay, that's there. You know, it's sitting there in flash memory. What takes time? Download the data from, from the server, from the cloud, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> word size, again, the interconnection. Word size works in close, it's closely integrated with the size of the buses. And it's, and it's, it's intuitive, you know. 32-bit, okay, 4 bytes, 64-bit, 8 bytes. Of course, an 8-lane highway is going to have twice the throughput as a four-lane highway. But the real big difference here <clears throat> with word size and buses, too, is the addressing it permits. Okay? 32 bits, I can address 4 million locations. Okay? So essentially, the, that's what I'm limited to um, in, in addressing in both memory. And, it, of course, it's going to determine the chunks, the size of my clusters on my hard drive. 64 bits, okay, I'm no longer constrained to that. I can have much greater, much more, much larger amount of RAM. And I can also have smaller cluster sizes out of my hard drive as well as I can support larger hard drives. Um, one of the things we haven't covered yet, and we will when we get to operating systems and other things, in order to work on a piece of data, it has to be in memory. I cannot change something directly out on my hard drive. In order to change anything on my hard drive, I have to read it into memory and write it back out. And let's look at that hard drive. That hard drive is moving, what, you know, 7,200 rotations per minute. 
an ice age in contrast to, to my 2.4 gigahertz, you know, billions of cycles per second. Rotations per minute, 7,200 cycles, billions of cycles per second. These two numbers are so far apart. Okay? So anytime I have to go back to my hard drive, anytime I have to go out to storage, and we'll look at the memory hierarchy, storage hierarchy here shortly, my system is just going to slow to a crawl. So the more things I can have in memory, the faster my system can be. Okay? So there are a lot of things at play here. Um, I just introduced, and I really wasn't ready to introduce it, but since I did, I'll qualify it, the memory or storage hierarchy. As I move away from the CPU, things get slower and slower, but they also get more affordable. The fastest type of memory, of course, is going to be my registers, followed in, in succession by my level 1, level 2, and level 3 cache. Okay. <clears throat> Following that will be my RAM, and then my secondary storage, my hard drive, flash storage, whatever, and then also offline storage. Offline storage is my backup, take backup, things of this nature. But building any system is always a compromise because we could never afford to buy a system that used just all cache memory. That would be one fast system, and that typically is what, you know, when you look at what Google is doing and the way that they are able to provide their answers so quickly, they're using very fast storage. That's what they're doing um, as well as their own, you know, proprietary technologies. <clears throat> so. What do I have? When I increase the number of cores, I increase the complexity of my operating system. But I also now, because trying to keep the CPU fed with information, I have levels 1, 2, 3 cache, I have RAM, and I also have things out of storage. I may have the same piece of data replicated across various components in my memory in my storage hierarchy, right? The same piece of data may be in my cache, my RAM, and my hard drive. And I now need to take into account, and I need to correct this or update it over time. So again, as I move to these different levels of cache, I'm also increasing, further increasing the complexity of my operating system to make sure that I remain coherency across all my data, across all my memory hierarchy components. Okay. So bus width and speed, I already presented this. <clears throat> Memory. Now, I asked everyone to look up the boot sequence. Can anyone describe to me the old, outdated, BIOS based boot sequence? Go for it. Boot up, so post detect power. And where does it, where does it find those instructions? Uh, CMOS. Yep. Or ROM. Right. Right. Um, CMOS is the, the complementary metal oxide, which is what the RAM is made of. ROM Ooh. is made out of. Okay. Um, um, then uh, it, after post, it looks on it's in the storage devices after checking everything else for, on the specific boot sector on the storage devices. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So I turn on my computer. The computer goes, the computer knows nothing. You turn it on, it knows absolutely nothing. Okay? It goes to a predefined location in ROM and starts to load and loads those instructions that will at first do a power on self check test. Trouble speaking today. Okay? So it tests all the components, whatever's attached, tests its RAM. Okay? And then it will continue loading its BIOS, basic input output system. What is the main What's the model of computation? Input, processing, output. So until the computer knows how to input and output, it really can't do any processing. Because it loads and understands now how to do input and output, okay, um, <clears throat> it will jump to the boot sector okay, and load an operating system. But if you've ever done this, and I'm sure you know, gamers and a bunch of people have, you're able to interrupt it, right? You're able to interrupt your BIOS and change settings before it loads the operating system, right? So it had that basic input output input output system running because you had at least a graphical or excuse me a text based ability to change the BIOS settings. 
Then you hit save and exit, or save, you know, exit and save, or, or exit without saving. Then it loads the operating system from the boot sector, from the hard drive, typically. So here's the question. <clears throat> Why is a boot sector virus so nasty? But why? Because then you got to reinstall your computer. If you have one, right? Right in the Nasty, but, but why? Where's the boot sector virus reside? Boot sector. Is it getting loaded before or during the operating system load? Yes. Is any antivirus software loaded at that point? No. So boot sector viruses can mask themselves. They can turn off your antivirus. Typically, the only way to get rid of them Format. Now, I, I will do a forensics demonstration, just a very basic one. I won't get into too, into too much. Um, but I'll demonstrate a binary hexadecimal editor. We'll actually take, well, no, I'm not going to show that. I'll show you where the boot sector and the master boot record are. So there actually are ways to find it and rebuild it. Um, how much effort do you want to go through? You know, um, you know, are you the FBI? Are you the CIA? So it really depends who you are. How much time you have? Um, so, um, <clears throat> so RAM, of course, is volatile. Random access memory. You turn the computer off; it's gone. But increasingly, there are other types. You know, at some point, we probably will see flash memory. It's right now. It's it's limited flash memory. There are two types based on NAND and NOR. Um, and I don't really want to go into this at this point, but. Um, it can either be written to very quickly or read from very quickly. It can't really do both at this point. And that's what RAM has to do. You have to be able to write to it quickly and receive from it. Now, of course, there are types of RAM. You know, there are people in here, you know, with, with networking training, NVRAM, non-volatile RAM. You know, so it's not volatile. It will retain its settings. You can turn it off. Um, we won't go into that at this point. <clears throat> okay, this slide here. Um, um, I can't believe they put it in the text. But I left it up here on the slide just because it disturbs me. Um, what's wrong with this picture? Where does that addressing start in their depiction there? What's that first address? 0001. Is that where we start counting in computer science? No, never. Zero based addresses. We don't waste anything. Zero is a valid address. And it, it's, you know, how do we learn to count? One, two, three, four. Three or four years old. Um, truthfully, we should learn to count starting at zero, but it's kind of an abstract concept, so two-year-old, three-year-olds don't quite get it. Um, <clears throat> although my, my daughter, when she was two, she was, should count, you know, teach her to count, she go zero, one, she'd go one, zero, I'm like, wow, she's counting in binary out of the gate, it's cool, you know, until I learned it was really just, you know, happenstance. Um, so, zero-based addressing. Java, arrays, things of this nature, the first index is zero. Um, <clears throat> so we've kind of covered this, registers and ROM. ROM being replaced by flash memory, okay? Because again, it's read-only memory. We can use flash that is optimal for reading, okay? Flash just hasn't quite matured to the point to where it can replace RAM. And of course, once it does, we have the always-on computer, which is really nice. Um, so. What's nice in flash memory, and actually we'll talk about ports here, and we're just going to blow over this. Again, it's a moving target. We are seeing some standardization, largely because the speeds are getting there. We don't need dedicated connections for individual devices. USB 3.0, Thunderbolt 2.0 can support video, can support backup, it can support everything, and it can be daisy chained. So, great. Give me a single port. USB 3.0, Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt 2.0, you know, get rid of all these extra things. And of course, with fewer ports, they cost money. Costs will come down. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, with, with fans, of course, as CPUs get hotter, we have to cool. What do we have to do? You know, we have to power the cooling system, batteries, okay, or some kind of power supply. So yes, they kind of fight against themselves. Interestingly, like. Eight, nine, ten years ago, someone cooled, sunk a PC in a vat of Crisco oil. It worked. I don't know what they were trying to prove, but it worked. You know? uh, so if you have that, you know, yes, you can overclock because you know the heat is being dissipated. Um, 
I'm not going to talk about expansion slots and cards. You know, God forbid you're on the Apple system. They tell you what expansion slots and cards you can use. So while I'm an Apple advocate, I'm also see them for what they are, um, business decisions. So I not really talk about any of these. Firewire I, I, is history. Um, USB 3.0 is nice. Um, anybody have 3.0 installed on the system? Yeah, I do. What are you using for? Um, I'm not much. Much. <laughs> yeah. Because I don't you have it. I have it. Yeah. yeah. It works with 2.0. It's okay. It's backward compatible. Why not? There you go. It's yeah. blue. It's fancy. Yep. So, you got like, something that's really, really fast. Otherwise, it's useless. Yeah. I actually I have, have a. And it's connected to 3.0. That's yeah. all I have. Although, you know, the, the prices, because I, I, back, you know, I have a uh, time machine for my Mac, and it's and it's running off Thunderbolt. And, I mean, literally, I'll come in after summer break, uh, and it's and it just like, it's taken a snapshot, you know, backed up my system. And uh, that was expensive. The Thunderbolt drive, you know, two terabyte was six, seven hundred dollars or, or even more. Yeah, ridiculous. And but you look at now on on Apple's site, they now have the USB 3.0, two terabyte for like a hundred thirty, hundred forty dollars. And I'm like, okay, I can deal. Um, okay. So inside the system unit, we're not going to really look at much here. Again, things are changing. Desktop. Um, the CPU, what we need, and again, tomorrow I'm going to do the numbering systems. I'm also going to do a fetch execute cycle simulation. Um, a really nice one, actually. Um, the CPU, two major components, main components, are the arithmetic logic unit, ALU, and the control unit. Now, the text also goes into you know floating point unit. Floating point unit works in conjunction with the ALU. Um, the prefetch unit and the decode, decode unit work in conjunction with, or maybe even be thought of as a part of the control unit. Two main components, ALU, control unit. The others kind of work with the ALU and control unit. Um, we will see, um, I'll go back to that in a minute. Oh, getting ahead of myself. Um, with the fetch execute cycle, okay, is the fetch decode execute cycle, and that will become very apparent tomorrow. Um, Note that the system clock is not one and the same as the CPU clock. The CPU clock will click or work on a faster cycle than the system, and hence that's why the interconnections are the major limiting factor. The system clock is the bus speed. Okay, what is going on in the buses? CPU is much moving much faster, so we have to create mechanisms to keep the CPU fed with data. Here's the fetch decode execute cycle. This author loves to put that store in there, so we'll just kind of take it with a grain of salt and say yes. Um, not going to talk about improving performance. RAM, okay? Out of the gate, buy the fastest buses you can afford. Of course, if you're buying an iPad, well, you get what you get, or any Mac, actually. Um, I'm not going to look at some of the new advances, you know, quantum computing. Um, a lot of this speculation. Quantum computing will get here at some point. Um, optical computing will probably be here a lot sooner. Okay, 3D, things like that. And with 3D, of course, the distances are getting smaller, and so there's less latency there. Um, and that's essentially the chapter. Um, I'm going to talk about pipelining and parallel processing in much more detail in operating systems. I'm actually going to defer that until that point. So that's it. Um, again, tomorrow I'll do numbering systems. Please read that um, addendum on cs100.com. Uh, and I'll do the fetch execute cycle stimulation. And don't don't put off with the Linux labs either. Um, pretty much I'm available all, you know, even on the weekends. But some weekends I do go away or do other things. So if you wait until Friday and then send me a message that you need help, sometimes I won't get it. So, so don't delay. That's it.